Thank you all for coming. It's my privilege to introduce a man who really doesn't need an introduction. And I'd like to welcome him to the Classic Gaming Expo for the first time. And it's safe to say if it wasn't for this man, probably none of us would be here today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nolan Bushnell. Utah. 
know, which one doesn't belong? I mean, <laughs> but uh, Dr. Evans was uh, very instrumental in some of the early uh, uh, computer graphics work. Uh, Ted Catmull, Ivan Sullivan, and, uh, 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 Jim Clark, um, and Bob Warnick, for example, all were sort of part of the what we call the uh, the University of Utah Rat Pack. So um, at that time, the minute video screens were connected to digital computers, of course, the very first thing was programmed for them, games. And of course, the famous space war, which was done by uh, Steve Russell out of MIT. And we would play that till the middle of the night, or actually we'd start in the middle of the night and play until the dawn. Because in those days, it was the big main breaks. The only times you could get to use computer time was in the middle of the night when regular batch jobs were going. And so that was my college days. And it was very easy to see that if you could connect a video screen um, to a computer and play the kind of games that we were playing at night, and put a quarter slot on it and put it in the amusement park, you'd make a lot of money. And uh, but you divide 25 cents into a $7 million computer and the math didn't work. And so I sort of put the idea on the back burner and continued to pursue my degree, graduated, and uh, came to California to work for Ampex Corporation. Um, Ampex Corporation at that time was the video company to work for. It was a... Um, it was a company that developed the videotape, the first big helical you know, scan uh, or rotary scan uh, videotape recorders, and they built full TV studios. It's that time when I really got to understand raster scan, scan electronics and video and on a really pretty profound basis. Um, so. Um, been working there for a year, year and a half, and I was playing Go. Um, I had been a, a tournament ranked chess player in college, played number two board for the University of Utah, and um, there was one Iranian guy that I could just never beat, and it really used to bug me, but uh, number two was good enough. And, um, and I became fascinated with the game of Go. There was a Go Club in San Francisco, and a fellow that was there was a research fellow at Stanford SRI, at Stanford uh, uh, AI project up in the hills. And he says, you know, you've got to come by and play Space War again. And I said, wow, yeah, I haven't played that for a long time. And so one night after playing Go, we went down and played Space War until the wee hours of the morning at the, at the AI lab at Stanford. And uh, I told him about my idea that someday it would be great to put these into uh, a game center or amusement park, what have you. And, um, and serendipity happened the following day at Ampex. I opened up an electrical engineering magazine, and there we had a uh, data general mini computer that was in OEM quantities priced at $5,000. And uh, all of a sudden, it looked like the math did work. And in fact, I said, what we could do is with a mini computer, I can build the interface. Because in those days, a video interface was essentially a, a, a vector graphics simulated radar display. And they were selling for about 30,000 bucks. So I knew I had to do something different in terms of display. So my idea was to build an interface unit, map the thing onto a raster scan, and do all the mathematics and the calculations on the mini computer. So I did a design, and my plan was to time share it, but I, I felt that I really needed about six coin slots, um, or six screens, on one mini computer to make the whole thing that's loud. Because in those days, a video game or a, uh, a mechanical game cost about a thousand dollars, and so I felt by the time we got all through this, it cost about six thousand dollars. It'll earn a little bit more money, so but 
you know, a thousand dollars machine could work. Um, and so I started the design, and I kept running out of CPU cycles. I mean, this talk about a piece of crap. These things were so slow. Um, I mean, think about um, instruction per second. And these were really these were eight big instructions, and they were really weak instructions. Um, going at a blazing 250 kilohertz. Um, all the speed you could want, you know, no matter what. So um, it kept running out of time, so I had to cut it back from five to four. And, um, and then I got into worst case situations where, you know, if all people were doing all this at the same time, you'd have overflow problems. And, and I decided it couldn't be done. And so I really was disappointed, and I had, had to sort of abandon it. In the process, I kept offloading functions from the mini computer onto hardware. And so I kept making the display smarter so that it wouldn't take as much stuff from the mini computer. And so it was around Thanksgiving time. I spent the whole Thanksgiving holidays working on the project. At the end of the Thanksgiving holidays, I uh, I had abandoned the project. I said, can't be done. Got to wait till we have faster mini computers. Um, just before Christmas, I had what I like to call the epiphany. And I said, to hell with the mini computer. I'm going to do it all in hardware. And, um, and in two days, I had a complete design for computer space, which was the precursor to Pong. And, uh, and the wonderful thing about it is by, it turned out that there was so much hardware that was involved in interfacing with the mini computer and buffering and, and what have you, that I actually saved terminal chip count by getting rid of the micro, microcomputer itself. Now, it was a single purpose unit. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the early video games were not von Neumann architecture. They uh, did not execute a computer. They were basically very, very complex signal generators, in which if you wanted to put a digit of score up, you added it onto the, onto the board a four-bit counter. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, so, and that was the state of the technology. Remember, the, uh, we're talking about 1970, the first microprocessor wasn't invented uh, 4004, which was just barely a microprocessor, um, until 74. And the 6502 wasn't around until uh, 76. So, so we had to do something other than micro <laughs> computers. <laughs> um, is this too much detail? No. 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 Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so anyway, we uh, the first uh, computer space um, that we didn't really have mass ROMs available, so we actually created the shapes of the rocket ships by having diode matrices in which um, on the on the printed circuit board we had a, a 1 to 16 scanner, 1 to 16 bit decoder along the bottom. And at every place that you wanted the unit to be bright, insert a diode. And so you'd actually look at the boards and you could see the outlines of the ships and diodes. Um, you guys have one of these here? Have it? Anyway, it was kind of a, an interesting design. All of the uh, all of the motion objects were actually uh, counters that overflow. And how we created motion was we had one set of counters that created sync uh, horizontal video. But then uh, for the active elements, we would have another set of counters that matched the count of the sync generator with one exception. They had a preset. They were either preset to zero, one, or two. And, uh, and we made the sync generator so that it was always reset or presetted at one. And so if you wanted an object to go backwards, you just, or, or to the left, you preset to zero. And so compared to the sync generator, it would slip. 
one uh, pixel per frame. If you wanted to go, if, if you wanted to move it one pixel per or 60 pixels per second, which is the maximum speed we could do at that time. And uh, if you wanted to go, if you want to stay still, you just preset it to one. If you wanted to go forward, you preset it to two. And you do that in both the horizontal and vertical. That's how we got our horizontal and vertical motion using only uh, 16 bits of count. So that was uh, that was what was the core subject of the Bushnell patents, the things that are the, really were the foundation technology of the video game. Um, so computer space um, was designed, and now I wanted to get it on the market, and I found out that there was a company in the area, and I was living in Santa Clara, California at the time, in Mountain View, called Nutty Associates. Nutty Associates built a quiz game using a slide, basically a film strip, asking questions and, uh, and giving you score for some answers. And it had about run its course, so the company was actually in, in trouble when I went to, I didn't know it at the time, but they were sort of on the edge of bankruptcy. Um, and um, I went there and I said, hey, uh, would you like to produce this game? And they said, sure, let's, let's do it. And um, they said, oh, by the way, we just laid off our chief engineer. Do you want to come work for me for us as the chief engineer to get this in, in production? Because we don't know anything about this technology. I said, sure. Um, and so I took the amount of salary that I was getting at Ampex, and I doubled it. And I said, uh, that's what I, I need that to go. Plus, they said, okay, fine. And I said, plus I'm going to need a car. They said, okay, fine. And all of a sudden, you know, I went from a, a $825 a month engineer to uh, 1600 bucks a month, which was really big money in those days. Um, and, uh, and I was happy. And plus I had a royalty deal on computer space. And I got it into production. But no sooner did we get it into production than I started seeing the nutty, the all was not really well with nutty. And uh, they didn't know how to market. They didn't know how to sell. They didn't really know how to manufacture. Um, but the game was a modest success. We went to a trade show, and the, the machine earned a lot of money in college campuses um, and various places. But it was, you know, it used Newton's second law and, and uh, you know, the conservation momentum, you had to reverse the rocket ship and fire and things like that. And it was a little baffling to, to the drunk with a beer. Um, so uh, all my friends loved it, but all my friends were engineers. So uh, it was, uh, I think we sold uh, 2,000 of the units at, uh, at 1,200 bucks a piece. We got we decided it was time to build another game. We had, I had a whole bunch of other ideas. But I could see that there was some real problems with nutting, and so I said, you know, I'll do another game for you, but uh, basically you've got to give me uh, a piece of the company and a uh, much more significant role in management. Because uh, I just think there's some mistakes being made. And companies are in trouble get in trouble for real reasons. It's usually because there's management issues. And they said, no, Nolan, you're a good engineer. You just stay in the engineering and we'll run the company. And, um, and we'll give you an option on what I consider to be a very paltry amount of stock. And under their management, I didn't have any confidence in stock anyway. And so I said, I, I'll think about it. And I thought about it long enough to call up my friends at, uh, in Chicago. And I had a little bit of reputation at the time and got a contract with uh, Valley Manufacturing to build the second game. And uh, they agreed to pay so much a month in engineering costs. So now I have my, my uh, royalties and uh, the cash flow from this contract. And I said, okay, it's time to set up my own shop. And so Sys G Engineering 
um, had its own place. So we got a garage shop, 1,000 square feet, whether we needed it or not, on Scott Boulevard. Uh, roll up door in the back, one office in the front, and a coffee machine. Um, we were in business. Um, at that point, uh, the uh, we uh, decided that we take a contract manufacturing and design job from Nutting as well. And so we had two contracts, and that was more than I could handle. So uh, I decided I was going to hire the best and the brightest and the cheapest guy I knew, and that was Al Alcorn. And Al had worked for me at Ampex. He had just graduated from Berkeley. And, um, he was on a work-study program where he worked at Ampex for six months, then pursued a degree in, uh, in, uh, at, at Berkeley. And it turns out that they worked in teams, sort of a tag team, and, uh, and they were my assistants. At, and Alcorn was one, and Bristow was the other. And so uh, they, uh, they were tag teaming, and they were my first employees. So, Anyway, uh, Alcorn comes on board, and I show him the technology, and he says, man, this stuff's kind of complex. Because uh, the, there were a lot of chips. There were a lot of chips in those days on these things. And so I said, well, why don't we, uh, why don't, I'll give you the simplest project to get you up to speed on the stuff. And so I made up a project from, uh, and I said it was from General Electric, and it was just to do a real simple game. Um, the simplest game I can think of, which was the Pong game. Now, there's been a lot of talk and, and controversy about Magnavox, you know, Robert, uh, uh, Ralph Bear, and the Magnavox patents. And, uh, and the, the reality is, is that I did in fact see the Magnavox product probably somewhere around that time. But it was the Magnavox uh, game that they had was a failure at the time. And so the last thing I wanted to do was copy a failure. Um, I saw this as a, a, you know, a training project for Alcorn. I never thought that it would have commercial results. First of all, it was a two-player game, and uh, only, and everybody said, you know, you have to have a single-player game. You can have a two-player game as an adjunct to a single-player, but a two-player game, there had never, never been one that had been successful. <laughs> so, uh, so now, prototyped it up and got the ball moving, got the paddles on the screen, and uh, the ball just went straight back and forth with the paddles. I said, well, we've got to get some angulation in here, so why don't we structure it so that when if the ball hits the top edge of the paddle, it'll bounce up, bounce, if it hits the middle, it'll bounce straight across, if it's sort of in between, it'll have a slightly more oblique angle. The minute that algorithm was put into the game, the game was fun. And we found ourselves liking to play it over and over and over again. And, uh, and this was never, you know, this, this was totally uns unsuspected for us. And uh, this was in the fall, this was about the fall of 1971, I think. And, um, and so uh, we built a couple of them up, and um, and we put the um, put one in a, a um, metal case, and I had a party at my house, and we took it home, hooked it up to the TV set, and literally we couldn't get people out of the out of the living room that night. I mean, they, they were playing it over and over and over and over and over and over again. And probably about 2 or 3 o'clock, I had to put everybody out so we could get some sleep. So we decided to test it at uh, Andy Cast Tavern. And yes, the story is true. We had one of these little coin mechs 
pasted on the side of the unit that was, I think we stole from the kitty ride. And, uh, and it had a very small uh, quarter receptacle and I uh, filled it up in a day. And, uh, and when I, <clears throat> and Al says, well, how do we know if we've got a success? I said, if we do $10 a day, it's a huge success. If it does $20 a day, um, it'll be a record breaker. He was doing $35, $40 a day. So, gave you our door. Um, so I, I thought to myself, hey, uh, Midway had, uh, Midway and, and uh, Valley, they were the same at the time, uh, had contracts with Mr. Bill's driving game. And so I thought to myself, driving games can take a lot more time. That maybe they'll like this uh, product. So I climb on an airplane to Chicago and present them, you know, have the metal box. I hook it up to the TV in their, in their corporate offices. And TVs in corporate offices were not, you know, didn't happen very often in those days. I hooked it up. They played it a few times. But they said the same thing. They said, you know, uh, it's a two-player game. Uh, we don't know. We'll get back to you. And uh, Valley and Midway both had an amusement division. And so they sent me over to Midway, and I presented to Midway. And um, they said the same thing. They said, well, I don't know. Let us think about it. And um, so I fly back to California, and uh, I hadn't heard, actually, about the earnings of the machine at that point in time, because uh, it had just gone out, uh, out on test when, uh, when Alan put it out. When I got back, I was actually dejected. I thought I had, had a big failure. Yeah, I wasn't able to do what I wanted to. I wanted to get, the, get, a, get rid of Pong and uh, fulfill my contract three months early be off to other things. Um, so after I heard the earnings, Green Navarus set in. And uh, I said, you know, I can probably build these things. And even if I can't sell them, they're earning so much money that I can make a cash flow. And so I did some quick calculations and figured out that if we used every bit of money and credit and stealth and guile that we had, we could build 11 machines. So we, we set out the purchase orders to buy the parts for 11. And these are the famous yellow fronts, or the orange fronts, of which there are only 11 in the world. Um, and I don't know if any of them are the one. Does anybody know of the orange front long? Anyway, there are 11 orange front long, longs. And because uh, we thought orange was a cool color, uh, it wasn't. Not so at the time. And uh, and we started building it, but I had a had a problem now because it, I didn't want Midway and Valley to come back and say that they wanted it. So I called up uh, the guys at Valley, and they said the guys at Midway don't want Pong; they want to. They want to go ahead and get the, uh, the drive to the driving game. Um, is that, do you, do you concur with that? And they say, yeah. So I call up the guys from Midway and they said, the guys from Valley don't want the long game. They want to get, go ahead and get the driving game. And so is that what you want? And so basically, they both agreed to pass on Pong. <laughs> I, was, I was free to go. And so rock and roll. So we built up our first 11 units, put two of them up to uh, advance automatic sales, one down to Hotel Amusements in Los Angeles. And we had a problem because we had forgotten to buy shipping containers. So we didn't know how to get them to Los Angeles. So we went down to the, the local uh, used truck store and we bought an old steak bed truck for 80 bucks. <laughs> And it was worth every penny of it. <laughs> um, and it was from it was from Adam Furniture. It still had 
furniture sort of rubbed out, but it still said Adam on the top of it. And so that became known as the Adam Hart Mother. And it would make runs from Atari to uh, Los Angeles, um, just tying the machines down. And, uh, and that's how we dealt with our shipping problem, because we found out unlike all the other stuff that you could really scramble and, and, and get put together in a big hurry, shipping containers took almost uh, two and a half months at that point in time. And we weren't going to let two and a half months get under our skin. Then we did another real smart thing. We were increasing uh, employment. So what do you do? You, you go to the California unemployment office. You didn't realize that only drug addicts and derelicts actually went through the state of California. And um, so we found that our first group of, uh, of employees were actually heroin addicts. <laughs> and, uh, and that was really not good because we found, because we were buying regular television sets, modifying them um, to go into the machines. Well, it turns out that a 12-inch television set is pretty easily fensible. And, uh, so we had a little bit of an inventory control problem. We got that fixed. Uh, and, uh, and then we had problems because we were starting to do a lot of testing. In those days, chips were really flaky. And the chance of you putting, I think there were 73 chips on a pong board, but once you put 73 chips on a pong board, chances of it actually working first time was about zero. So you had to have every board troubleshot. And, uh, and so that was a skilled technician. So we went down to uh, the local tech school and uh, got as many guys as we could that had that could hold a soldering iron and trained them. And uh, that gave us Dan Van Eldren and uh, several of the people who stayed with Atari that for a long time. We actually pulled them right out of tech school. Um, and so that was kind of the first round. And then as we actually got shipping containers, we found that uh, we had a worldwide market. And overnight, I had a backlog of 1,000 machines. Uh, and, um, you know, of course, we had no money um, because everything was stuck in inventory and, you know, test equipment. We actually, you know, had to use sawhorses and sheets of plywood for tables and benches and things. And so it took a, um, so we basically just worked deals with vendors and, uh, and I told Al Horn that, um, you know, in two weeks, I want to be ramped up to 100 a day. Now, Gordon says, you know, Bushnell, you, know, you are absolutely crazy. There's no way we can do that. I said, yeah, but we can try. And, um, and in two weeks, we were ramped up to 100 a day. And, and we had to take over a really crappy old facility. It was old, this was the roller skating rink. It been abandoned for about 10 years. Uh, cobwebs and everything. But it had a great hardwood floor in it. Uh, and so we found that we could deliver product, you know, we could roll product down the line on skateboards. Um, <laughs> this is when we first uh, started piping in rock music. I think we, the average age of the employee at that point in time was uh, just about 22. I think we had a whole bunch of 18, 19, 20 year olds. And it was, it was basically a nonstop party. Worked hard. But every time we hit goals, we had a beer bash because yeah. it was it was a heck of a lot cheaper uh, buying a few kegs than it was uh, giving everybody a raise. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, so we got we got this reputation as being a party company. But what people didn't realize is that there was sound business behind it. The, the age of our employees. A beer bash was actually more fun than earning more money because uh, this was the age of the Aquarius and these were great parties. Everybody was young, everybody was single. Um, it was, it was uh, 
it was good. And, you know, and then slowly, slowly we had to start putting a little bit of structure into the company. Because we didn't really have enough time to do structure to begin with. Because um, we were basically making it up as we go along. Uh, I've never run a factory before. None of the, company, none of the people that we were working with um, had run a factory before. I hadn't thought that I could probably hire somebody that had, had run a factory before. But, you know, we were, uh, we were figuring it out. And, uh, and times were very, very good. Um, but we realized that it was going to be a fight to the death because about six months into this, all the other coin-op companies had knocked us off and we're starting to ship TV tennis, winter, you know, basically they Xerox our board uh, because our patents that were applied for hadn't been, you know, hadn't been uh, given yet. And it really, being young and green, I was, it really pissed me off. Um, these guys were copying me and there wasn't anything I could do about it. Uh, so, I figured the best thing that we can do is to strategically keep ourselves in, um, and, and win it based on innovation. So our strategy was twofold. The first thing I wanted to do is keep the other guys from taking video games seriously. And so I kept trying to feed to the business that the video game was kind of a fad and that uh, it was just a transition. The next thing we did is we partitioned off a, a room in the engineering building, in the engineering section, and we brought every hologram we could find. And so with our distributors, we knew that there were a lot of double agents, people who, whatever you told them, it was going to go right back to our competitors. And so we bring the, these, in, these guys in and say, now, you can't tell anybody. And we take them back into the engineering room, into the spark of the room, where we had all these wonderful holograms. And they are very impressive, you know, that had perfectly lit everything. He said, video games are just passing. This is the future. <laughs> and uh, we really didn't want to, uh, you know, we weren't really working on holograms yet. But, because uh, we couldn't figure out, but we knew that the video games, and we didn't want the other guys to get serious about ramping up engineering to compete with us. As long as they wanted to copy us, we knew that we would have a three to six month lead time. And if we were really tricky and we started doing things like uh, uh, cornering the market on certain chips. So we obviously, we would purposefully design into, put into design some of our uh, units, a, um, a chip that was, in, that was sort of a not very heavily used chip. Because we had friends in all the semiconductor companies, we knew exactly how many of that chip was made. So before we release, these were 15, 20 cent chips. We try to corner the world market on that chip. Um, and, it, and it turned out that you could do it. You know, things like, you know, quad or gates and things like that that didn't that many of them. And so we would design a new product like Space Race. I think it has a couple of bizarre chips in it just for that reason. We then cornered the market on it. And then that was an interesting thing because the, as you cornered the market, the price would start to go up. Well, it turns out that we found out that we had 140% of which was built, but this is how many we bought. Well, we went in and did a quick inventory, and we found out that somebody in our warehouse was selling them out the back door, and we were buying them back in the front door. <laughs> um, so we got that fixed. Uh, that <laughs> So, anyway, piece by piece, we were able to kind of out innovate. Um, to give you an idea about the, the state of the industry, 
We were a California company, virtually all of the coin operating game business was out of Chicago. So uh, we were considered to be the strange California company. Everybody knows that every that the nation was tipped and everything was a little loose spelled in California. Um, and so we were this this strange California company and, and the distributors weren't sure whether they really trusted us or not. And so we had to uh, really fight tooth and nail for, for market share. Uh, and at the AMOA show uh, the following year, after Pong had been a big success, there was a panel, a trade show. And the panel was on the future of the video game. And I wasn't invited to speak. And all the guys that had knocked off Pong were. And I was so pissed. <laughs> I mean, it was really something that we just, you know, I said, how can this be? And so I listened to these guys basically mumble and, and fiddle around for, during the speeches. When it came time for the question to answer, I stood up and I let them have it with both guns and I said, these guys don't have a clue about what's going about the future of the video game business. Because the only thing they've been able to do so far is copy what Atari has designed. And I'm the only one that knows what's going on in the, in the labs of Atari. They sure as hell don't. And uh, at the end of this 15 minute rant that I gave, I got a standing ovation. <laughs> And I actually credit that as actually one of the turning points in Atari, because I said if you uh, if you continue to support copying, what you have is you will dry up the lifeblood of innovation. Your income is derived from innovation, not from specious manufacturing and copying. And uh, and I noticed that. Uh, it was a very, very different world after that trade show. So every once in a while, getting pissed off at the right time uh, can help you. Um, so we went sort of past the ball and paddle phase, the space race, and gotcha, boy, it was that a turkey. Um, and uh, moved along in, in the mix really huge mega hit with the track series, the driving games. And, uh, and they became just huge cash counts for us. Uh, but not initially. Initially we had a thing called Grand Track. And we priced it wrong. We had not had our cost uh, accounting figured out. And uh, it turned out that we were losing money on everyone that we created. And so we got into huge cash flow problems, almost put the company out of business. Uh, since then, people were always asking me, Nolan, uh, we're in real trouble. I was, we're thinking of declaring bankruptcy. And I said, well, why? Um, he said, well, we're, I said, how many uh, creditors' lawsuits do you have? Well, none. I mean, so you don't even have any judgments against you? No. So I said, you know, there was a six-month period where Atari had basically two creditor judgments against it uh, every month or every week. At one time, we had five creditor, uh, five sheriffs in the lobby at the same time, all to attach the same assets. And I said, um, you know, if you don't learn how to have six bank accounts and shuffle the money between them to keep them away from attachments, you're not really knowing how to play the game. Uh, so it wasn't all easy. I mean, it was a thing where the employees soon found that if they didn't, if they got their paycheck on Friday morning, that anybody who didn't cash their check that by lunch, chances are they weren't going to get clear funds. So, you know, it, uh, we worked through that. I mean, there was a six-month period where myself and none of the management got paid. I mean, we, we had our check paychecks made out to us, but we sort of had a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, put them in the drawer, and, uh, and but we got through it. So it's not always easy. Um, then we kind of move over to uh, our decision to enter the consumer market. 
the consumer market really came along to uh, our belief that the in-channel technology was fast enough that we could actually do Pong on a chip. And we felt that uh, using multiple chips was too expensive and would not be reliable enough for the consumer marketplace. And so uh, Al Schwarn found a guy named Hero Lee, who was a fabulous silicon designer, and we funded the project, uh, even though we didn't have any money. Uh, Al Horn has this great memo, he should publish sometime, in which I basically set out our goals for the next uh, uh, six months. And uh, he wrote back and he said, uh, does it uh, matter that we don't have any money to accomplish all this? And I said, no, he wrote it down, the explanation point. But we were always juggling cash because when you're growing like a weed, you chew up more cash. And everybody thought that the video game business was a silly business. I mean, we, we totally self-funded. No venture capital capitalists were interested until we didn't need it. So a story about a banker, a guy who lends you an umbrella and wants it back when it starts to rain. Um, and um, so we started the, the consumer business single chip, single product, long. We, uh, before we had it tooled, we made one out of wood, painted it really, really nicely. We had this wire rat box about this big uh, that emulated the, the, the uh, chip. And we said, okay, let's go get some orders. So we went to the toy fair in New York, February. Uh, and uh, we had drilled a hole up to the table so that the wire wrap box was under it, came up, screwed the, the pong to the tabletop because it didn't move. And it looked like it was pong. You know, we, we basically faked it. Um, and tried to get some orders. And so the people who think that innovation is easy, see, everybody says that they like innovation. And, and the reality is everyone wants the concept of innovation until they see it. And once you see something that's innovative, then everybody sees everything that's wrong with it and not of the things that are right with it. So we came back in the toy fair and we sold none, zero. So the very first consumer video game in the trade show experience, should have been considered a total failure. But not to be, you know, we, we just knew from all our friends and the people who played Pong that there was a market for this. And so we said, okay. And, and one of the things that the toy guys told us is the highest priced toy in my toy store is $29. And you want to sell this for $79. Uh, we just think it's too much for our clientele. So we said, aha, let's go to the, uh, the TV show, the TV shops, brown goods as they call them, the parts of the trade. So we, uh, we started hitting the toy, sh the uh, appliance shops. They said, no, don't want to finance these things. Uh, and besides that, Remember, Magnavox failed miserably in the whole market. They had, uh, had huge write-offs, and so everybody looked at that. They said, hey, why, what's, why is this different than the Magnavox trial? And so we were totally unsuccessful in the, uh, in the appliance side. And then uh, the previous Christmas, a home pinball had been sold through the Sears Sporting Goods Department. And Sears Sporting Goods, since they don't go into skis in the winter, basically turn into a rec room place where they sell home pool tables and ping pong tables. And they tried this uh, home pinball 
could have been pretty successful. So the buyer thought, well, you know, pool tables are in bars, pinballs are in bars, pongs are in bars. Maybe this will work in a in family room setting. And so we called him, and he was literally on our doorstep the following day. And uh, we thought, gee, this is cool. We had buyer from sporting goods department for Sears. And uh, we pitched him, showed him around, told him how wonderful the long game was going to be and how, how it was going to make him rich. You know, a pillar among buyers, Sears wide. And, uh, and so he sat down and he said, well, how many do you think you can make? And we had literally never thought about that. And so we... Uh, he said, well, you know, let, let me check with my, our manufacturing guy. He's got the numbers. So we went out. We knew that Gil Williams wouldn't have a clue at that point either. So, um, so we put our heads together and said, how many, how many do you think? And we thought, well, you know, probably won't have any of the tooling and the chip done until about August. Um, 25,000. So consensus was that we could probably make twenty-five thousand. So not wanting to be have an exclusive with Sears, I said seventy-five thousand to the buyer. Him not to be uh, outdone, gave us an order for one hundred fifty thousand. <laughs> so now, as we say, the bats in the fire, uh, and. Uh, we, uh, in the ensuing few days after he left, um, we just spent a lot of midnight oil trying to figure out if there's any way in God's green earth that we can build 150,000 of these things. And we came up with some ideas that, yeah, we probably could. Then it came to the thing that we said, there's just no way we can finance these. We don't even have a fraction of the money that's necessary to do this. Again, you know, venture capitalists thought the game business was totally falling. And uh, and we were we were better cash flow at this point in time than we were when the sheriffs were on the, on the doorstep. That was a year earlier. We sort of worked ourselves out of that problem. There was just no way we could do this. So I called up Tom and I said, Tom, there's just no way I can fund this. And uh, he's the buyer for Sears. He says, oh, not to worry, I'll introduce you to Sears Bank. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, he, what they did is they set up a bonded warehouse at the end of our production line. And the minute a product fell off the production line, into this bonded area, basically it was a cyclone fence, fenced area of the warehouse, we'd get 80% of the, of the sales price. So all of a sudden our cash flow was fixed, and uh, as we say, the rest is history. Um, any questions about this era? I'll push on a little bit later. Yeah. When did you when did you decide on the name Atari and why? Say again. When when did you decide on the name Atari and why? Uh, uh, Sysogy Engineering was what we had built uh, computer space. That was the name of the company. When uh, when it looked like this was going to be a real company and we were selling and, and I think it was when we I think we hit a million dollars a month, which we thought. <laughs> was really the big time. It actually is a nice, a nice milestone. We decided it was time to incorporate. And, uh, and so in those days, before the internet, what you had to do was you had to put down the names that you wanted and uh, in order. And the Secretary of State would go through and see the ones that have already been uh, taken and cross them off. Well, Atari was actually the fourth or fifth selection. First one was Syzygy. Second one, 
The third one, I don't remember what they were. But the uh, other one was Atari, and Atari came from the game of Go, and it was a polite warning to your adversary that you're about to be taken, which I thought was a suitably aggressive warning to our competitors. It also means jackpot in Japanese. And I just thought it was, I, I liked the onomatopoeia of the, the word. I thought it was a good word. Um, it, it's funny. Uh, because it, it means jackpot or bullseye, several times uh, after that, uh, a Japanese company, the Japanese guys would say, Atari, it's a very, very good name. But we think perhaps too boastful for Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, so we, it came back that uh, Sizuji had been taken by a Mendocino candle maker, um, much to our chagrin. Much, and, and in retrospect, Sizuji would have been a horrible name to go into the consumer market with. First of all, nobody can pronounce it anyway. Um, second of all, it used up all the Ys in any printing stuff. Uh, and, uh, and, and it came back Atari. And we, we were actually a little disappointed. We said, well, you know, what's in the name? We'll like it for a little while. And sure enough, we, uh, we ended up loving the name. The logo actually came from a guy named George Opperman, who was our chief graphics designer. And he uh, did a bunch of them. He looked through and he said, that one, but square up the sides a little bit so that it's. And he did. He put the Atari below it. That Fuji design, which you all drone was born. That actually, I actually have a, a business card that was in the interim. It was about, I think we incorporated in June of 72. And I think that. The Atari Fuji logo didn't happen until like November of '72. Uh, I don't know if you notice on the uh, on the early Pong logo pipes, uh, it said Atari Sizuji Engineer. That was because we thought we had a lot of equity in our name Sizuji, and we, we wanted to cross brand a little bit. Those people were out there just searching around for a Sizuji engineered product. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much the story. The early days of Atari, actually the early days of Sizuji. One of the things that we did is we started a coin-operated game route. And I wanted to do that for two or three reasons. First, um, I, I had four computer space prototypes that were fundamentally unoperable because they were A standard prototype boards. And I was probably the only person in the world that could fix them. But yet they earned money. And so I said, well, you know, I can buy these things from, from Nutty for 200 bucks, and, uh, which was the cost of the cabinet. Um, and put them on location. So I bought some pinballs, and, and that's why it happened to be in Andy Caps, because we operated all the pinballs and the other video games in Andy Caps. And we had the, uh, a pretty good route. And in fact, <coughs> right after the Pong things, the route was generating a lot of cash flow. And when I bought Dabney out, um, who was my partner from Amex, he was my office mate. And when I bought Dabney out, he took the route, and he was, uh, he had uh, the Atari operations uh, as part of his uh, compensation. Um, and he ended up with, with some stock in, in Atari and cash payout and, and the route. But I think we had the route up to a couple hundred pieces. This is the, this is the story, uh, that we had an arcade in Berkeley, just off Telegraph Avenue. And Telegraph Avenue is a little bit of a tough place. And Risto was still in school, and, and he ran the route in the Berkeley area. And uh, he and his wife uh, used to do, go and make the collections. And he applied for a handgun permit in Berkeley. Of course, People's Republic of Berkeley turned 
turn him down because uh, he had guns or not. Good things. Yeah, he was really worried because he was carrying relatively large amounts of cash down through this relatively seedy part of uh, Telegraph Avenue in Berkeley. And so their solution was that his wife carried a hatchet. <laughs> <laughs> True story. Uh, and uh, that was uh, their cash flow. And, and he was doing work for us. And, and uh, his compensation was that he got 15% of the receipts of the Berkeley operation. So that was uh, how we worked the cash flow there. Yeah. What was the relationship with the key game? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, I wanted to start getting a more professional management team in place. And in fact, I tried to hire an Atari president about six times because I knew for a fact that I didn't know what I was doing, but I was kept hoping that somebody else could. But I found out that most people who were deemed to be presidential material didn't know how to run a company without money. You know, like I got some guys from Hewlett Packard, total, total disaster. And I got a guy in uh, who was a management consultant, and that, total disaster. Um, and so when it came to scrambling, and keeping everything going when you didn't have money uh, to throw at problems. I found out that I was as good as there was, and uh, that was really disappointing to me. <laughs> uh, so, um, a guy that had lived across the street from me, named Joe Keenan, uh, who was working in timeshare and was a, a really I considered him to be one of the smartest guys I knew. Uh, said, you know, Nolan, I've been watching this. And he says, I'd like to come work for you. And I said, I'd love to have him work for me. And, and we were sitting around and he was saying, what are your biggest problems? And I said, well, I'm a basically a paranoid guy. And he said, I am afraid that there will be another small company. I pretty much stopped and figured out that, that the Chicago companies weren't being innovative. But I was afraid that some small little company was going to become innovative and maybe take market share. And that at that point in time, in the coin-operated game business, there were essentially two, in some cities, three uh, coin-op distributors. Well, we, and, and they tended to be, require exclusivity. And so if we chose one distributor, there was one guy who didn't have the line. And so I decided that I really needed to deal with that problem. Because if those guys that didn't have the line were going to be going out trying to find any little specious company they could to get into the business, and I said one of them might actually get a hit and hurt us. So let's see if we can dry up their potential for success. And so I said, why don't we do this? I said, we've got a lot of product coming down out of engineering. Why don't you take the number two man in manufacturing, the number two man in sales, the number two man in engineering, and uh, set up key games? And appoint all the distributors that we don't have and, uh, and it will look like it, you've got their exclusive, we've got your exclusive and then we'll figure out what to do once we figured this out. And so that's what he did. He rented another facility. We wanted to keep the idea that it was a, this was 100% owned by a target at this point. Um, and uh, we said, let's, let's put your name on it. So we called the Key Games after Joe Keenan. And we rented a place down the street. And then we concocted the story that there had been a palace coup that Keenan had left with a bunch of people who decided they were going to compete with Atari. And sure enough, the trade show launched sooner than they could have actually developed a product. They had a product on the street. 
And uh, of course, they went through, they appointed all the, the non-Atari distributors and sold the hell out of the product. And, uh, and then we uh, circulated the uh, rumor that there was a lawsuit. Of course, this was all made up. Uh, there was a lawsuit for theft of trade secrets and all this other stuff. <laughs> Then about a month went by and we said that there had been a settlement. And the settlement was that Atari had um, become a part owner in uh, key games. About a month later we said that Atari had become a majority owner of key games. Then about another month after that we said we decided we were going to merge the two companies together. <laughs> and so rather than, uh, than you know, take the, the line away from either side, because he, at that point, had come up, had, had done, had gotten, you know, like I say, every other game that was coming out of the engineering lab at Atari, we gave the key, and it turned out that Tank was a key game. It came out of the Atari lab, the Tank, <laughs> but it turned out to be a hit, and everybody wanted Tank at the time. So rather than take the line away, we gave both lines to both set of distributors. So we were the only company that had dual distribution and all point on the game set. So it was a, Key Games was a tactical response to a marketing problem. Um, back to the, uh, the Atari name briefly. I, I'm, I'm curious as to how, what your feelings are on uh, if is changing their name to Atari, their corporate name to Atari now. You know, I guess it's, I don't want to say despair, but, <laughs> you know, one of the things that you do when you're serial entrepreneurs is you feel a lot of fond memories and, and good feelings about the Atari that you knew. But I, I didn't feel like the Atari under Warner, Warner was the same company that I, you know, it had some of the same things, but it wasn't the same company as when I was running it. I mean, Ray Gassar and, and some of the guys, you know, well, when you stop to think about messing up one of the most powerful video game brands in the world, in, in very few years, you know, it's pretty frightening. And you get sad, but at the same time, you just can't deal with it. I mean, Ewing is, is, is what I'm focusing on now. My best projects are yet to come. Um, and, and, you know, I, I'm glad that, that actually that Atari is still in use rather than some atrophic uh, piece of nostalgia. You know, uh, and, and I, I hope that uh, if the brand streets it well. Yeah. Can you talk briefly about Atari involved in manufacturing involved machines? I can't hear you. Sorry. Can you talk briefly about Atari involved in involved machines? Sure. Of course, I was uh, talking about Atari's involved in involved machines. This is probably where I should <coughs> resume uh, a little bit. The, um, the next phase is sort of the phase in which Atari really grows up. I mean, we were a $50 million a year sales company. Um, things were pretty good. We had worldwide sales. Um, and we decided to expand into the pinball business. It was very, very obvious to us very soon that that the pinball business, unlike a, the video game business, tended to be commodity priced. And uh, if you had a single player pinball, it was priced at X. And if it was a two player pinball, it was X plus $100. If it was four, it was X plus $200. And, and we knew that since we were in California, we had two major disadvantages. One, California, you know, is a high labor state compared to Chicago. I mean, uh, 
things like workers' comp, which is which was bad then, it's now horrible. Uh, it really, under the current laws and regulations, it really doesn't make sense to manufacture in California anything. You can't really paint things in California, um, except houses, and, uh, and then you have to have permits. But, uh, <laughs> and so we knew that there was going to be a, a problem um, competing with the infrastructure of Chicago and various things with a generic product. And yet we felt that, uh, that we had a lot to offer. And so we decided to get into the pinball business, but only through what we call novelty pinballs. Pinballs that were different than the standard spot. And so the first innovation that we decided to do was the white body. And what the white body did more than anything else is it allowed us to put a little, a few more things on, on the play field, but really what it was there is to allow us to charge enough that would co cover our disadvantage. Uh, we had about a hundred dollar cost differential between um, between California and Chicago. We also figured there was about a fifty dollar shipping differential to the East Coast, and so we felt that we had to be able to make that up and yet still sell product. And so that, that was what we did. And that actually worked very, very well up through a planning session with, uh, with Warner. And um, it was probably after we sold the company to Warner, Warner uh, uh, they were at the planning sessions. And, um, and they had, and, and one of the execs that Warner had uh, heard some distributors saying that they wanted to try to build a regular pinball. Then he said, why, why don't you just build a regular pinball? I said, because you can't make any money out of it. And I went through the, the reasons why we've done all the pinballs. He said, well, you know, I don't know. They, my, my understanding is that you always want to do what the customer wants. The customer clearly wanted the standard pinball. Uh, and what they what they were really saying is they want standard prices. Um, and, and yet innovation. You know, everybody wants more for less. And um, and it turns out that the fight, one of the things that um, that led to my leaving Atari is I just said, guys, no way. We are not going to do a standard pinball. It makes no sense. You know, I'm on a bonus program. Um, and uh, it's silly to do to, to give do any product where you are going to lose money. And I said, I don't see any way that you can make money doing a standard pinball. They said, well, yeah, the market gets, you know, all these specious answers. Um, but anyway, um, after I left, Warner produced, I think, three standard pinballs and then closed the division because it was not profitable. Big company mentality. <laughs> um, and so that was the idea. Um, we had some wonderful, wonderful designs that were planned for the, the product line. We never saw the light of day because the idiots weren't. And uh, I've been sad because there's there's a couple of them that I would just love to play. Uh, Which were? One was called, uh, I think it was called uh, Earth, Heaven, and Hell. It was a three-layer pinball. And it was, uh, it was one where it was a very, very highly candid version up here. Or, or no, it was a very flat. That was heaven. And then there was one the play field here that sort of curved around. And then there was a hole down in hell that was very heavily canted and really heavy action. It was really a lot of movement. And you could actually move the ball from one level to another uh, and you got different things. And of course you basically set up certain targets in, on in Earth to either let you make more points in heaven or hell, that's the case you did. And it was always more fun to make a lot of points in hell. I don't know why. <laughs> uh, that's the one that I really wanted to play because I just felt that it was it was a very well-themed, well-structured 
exciting thing. Did you found Axelon Games or were you part of Axelon? Um, I founded Axelon Games. Um, Axelon actually started as a company that I venture, venture funded in Catalyst Technologies. And uh, it was not doing that well. And so I decided since it was already formed and had a few little things that that would be the, the basis for my toy company. Chris Boring, well, how did you deal uh, later on with the Atari 2600 you came back to do secret quests? Well, the, uh, maybe I should uh, go back in, in the chronology of things. Uh, the 2600 um, came, was conceived of shortly after we started, uh, have, since we had a, a success with the consumer farm. We knew that um, we needed variety and in innovation, and we felt that the world, um, do any of you guys remember Stunt Cycle? And uh, we did several Super Bomb and, and, and some of these. We felt that the, the life cycle for single purpose games was vanishing because, you know, you can only have your closet full of enough of that crap. <laughs> Because <laughs> as much as they were, you know, they were fun, they were, you know, Sun Cycle was basically a monster. And, um, you know, once you played it a few times, you've never seen it done it, pull it out when your friends come over. But other than that, it's a pretty, pretty boring game. Um, so we decided we needed a multi-game. And since we were now, had a good feeling about the 6502 as a, as a core microprocessor, we felt that we could do a graphics chip that could do pretty well. Of course, one of the problems was that memory was so expensive, RAM memory at that time was so expensive. We felt that we absolutely had to be under $200 retail. And the hardest part about the design of the 2600 was cost, getting it under the $200 retail price point. Um, there were, and in fact, it was a significant contingent inside Atari that believed that it had to be under $149, uh, which, uh, which at that time seemed like an awful lot of money. But we felt that we could do it for under $200, and uh, so we decided to do that. Uh, it turned out that uh, just before um, we were actually went into manufacturing. We had a, we had a price, a significant price reduction on uh, the 6502 chips that we were able to get. And so we were able to uh, make up for a couple of other mistakes that we made, like we screwed up on the tooling and it cost, the plastic cost us more. <laughs> In the manufacturing line, we had this one position. It was called the hammer. <laughs> and, uh, Basically, the two pieces of the 65 or the, the 2600 didn't fit together right. And the only way you could do it was to try to get it seated and then with a great big hammer, really whack it. And, uh, <laughs> it was uh, one of those fun things. Interesting anecdote on that is we couldn't hire enough people for our production line, particularly the night shift, uh, for the 2600. And so we decided that what we do is um, put everybody, all the engineers, all the accountants, all the salespeople on the production line uh, for three weeks and just put the regular job on hold. They, they'd go there, spend an hour doing their, what they normally did. The rest of the time, they had to be on the production line, including me and Ken and all the vice presidents and that sort of thing. And it turned out that that was an extremely valuable thing because you'd go out and you'd look at the production line and it looked like everybody was hoping. But you got us, you know, badass executives out there and you put them on the production line and all of a sudden you, you, it was like Lucy and Apple. You just can't, you couldn't keep up. And so you had to sort of slow things down until you got, got, got it figured out a little bit. 
But the thing that was really fun is after the engineers were on the, the line for you know two or three days, we had about 140 engineering change notices um, for things, and productivity and, 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 and efficiency of the line just skyrocketed. Things like specifying a different screw so that you only had you know this, instead of having 240 turns on the screw, you only needed six, <laughs> things like that. Uh, and it was really, uh, and, and they were actually able to figure out a way to get rid of the hammer position. <laughs> Thank you. 
think he did. Now that I think about it, um, unfortunately, there was a, there was a time when the company turned into three divisions, and four divisions, and five divisions, and you just you know there was sort of a core. 300 people that I got to know really well. This company got to 1,000, 2,000, 4,000. It, it, it gets spread out a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. They say, you got 15 more minutes. What do you want to hear about? <laughs> Can you say anything else about breakouts? <laughs> How about I come? I actually came up with breakout laying on the beach, sort of doodling in the sand. <laughs> and, uh, and basically what I wanted to do was to have a game that represented cleanup, completion. I believe that there's something in people's innate makeup, the psyche, that they like to clean stuff up, you know, get everything. And so I wanted to have it uh, be a structure which you're cleaning it up, but also I wanted it to be in a reward that if you could get the ball up on top, that it was doing a lot for you to clean things up with very little activity on your part. I thought that was really a good psychic reward. It turned out to work well for that. There are several rumors uh, around in the past. Is it true that you ever reconsidered reacquiring Atari? Well, I was more than considered. I actively pursued buying Atari coin up and had negotiated a price from Hasbro for the Atari name, for the consumer rights. What happened is Atari was essentially bifurcated into the consumer and the coin op side, and uh, Atari games went to the uh, the ability to use the name Atari Games went to the coin op, Atari Inc. went to the consumer. The, con uh, the consumer went to, you know, the Tremeals, to Hasbro, to uh, uh, the Infograms. And uh, I was trying to buy, I had a bid uh, in to buy uh, Atari coin op for the name. Uh, Williams actually had, or uh, I should say, uh, yeah, Williams, or uh, Midway, had a bid in that was actually lower than mine, because I had a wall on the inside, so I knew what all the bids were. Um, <laughs> you, know, you got to do your estimate, you know, good espionage. It's, it's key. And, uh, one of the things that you learn about big companies is that they like to bury, bury their dead quietly. And so they felt that Atari going into uh, Midway would probably go away. But the last thing they wanted is to have Atari come back and be highly successful because it would make them look like idiots. And they actually gave it to Midway even though they bid $2 million less than they did. Really pissed me off. <laughs> What's the huge history of Atari? What's your favorite game going back to the beginning, uh, both from an engineering standpoint you're working on, and then just playing? What's your favorite? Probably the hardest piece of technology that we had that we did that was that gave us a lot of trouble was. Um, uh, the color vector graphics technology. Uh, transistors in those days didn't like to switch high voltage, and particularly not at high speeds. And, um, and so that represented a real problem. And uh, Tempest was a very, I, I probably played Tempest an awful lot because of that. And so I have, from an engineering standpoint, Tempest is clearly my favorite game. From a, uh, an actual playing game, I have, some, I have really so many, and I've kind of moved from game to game to game over time. Uh, I have a, an interesting story about one of the early uh, video games called Night Driver. Do you remember that one? And um, we did 
in my driver, because you know, you can display such crappy graphics. <laughs> we felt that the only way we could really get a good first person going was just have the indications of the reflectors and the thing. So it was a pretty effective group, and it was all about doing it because of bad technology. But in testing that over and over and over again, we probably spent a day testing it, which was a euphemism for playing the hell out of the game. Um, and driving home that night, I was, it turns out that I was living in Top of the Hill Road, which is up Kennedy Road, which is kind of a windy Kennedy Road up, up in the back of the Scabbis. And all of a sudden, I was playing the same way I was playing night drive. You know, putting my little car through four wheel drifts and things like that. Before I realized that, you know, you just can't hit the reset button if you, if you go over the edge on this puppy. So uh, it was one of those things that scared me a little bit. I said, boy, you know, talk about uh, uh, game imitating life and life imitating game. Uh, that was closest to that game, something like that. Just pull up real quick. I'm sorry. What is um, a follow-up question? Do you still play field games? Do you still break out of games sometimes every once in a while? Um, right now, I'm playing Halo, Warcraft 3, uh, <laughs> and uh, I I've gotten into you know EverQuest and some of the, the massive RPGs. Um, I guess the uh, I still play Go over the internet a lot. Uh, I've, I've been playing a lot of, of small puzzle games because Uwink, uh, the company I'm currently working on, is building a game, a series of game platforms for uh, uh, public places. We're going really back to point up space. We're doing it with a different model in which we link um, all the coin-op games together over a wide area network using the internet. Uh, Dial-up or DSL lines, app tournaments, what have you. In fact, uh, how many of you remember x football? I would love, to, if, if there's somebody that really knows X's and O's football, it's also a reasonably good programmer. I'm looking for an X's and O's football uh, product that I want to farm out, uh, in which I, I want six player. I want six player X's and O's football. So you have one player doing right end, one doing left end, one doing quarterback. So you got three on three in a bar. I think it's great fun. So. If you know somebody that wants to do that, let me know. Um, let's see. Uh, those are about the games I'm playing currently. And the old ones in Oh, no, I play, I play them all you know, when, I'm, you know, get, when I get a hold of them. I still have a lot of fun with uh, Asteroids. I still like Asteroids a lot. Uh, I mean, actually, in this, this one thing we call Cyber Eve, we're actually bringing Pong back. We've got a six player Pong. Using trackballs and uh, things, and it's a lot of fun. We've been we've been beating each other up pretty heavily, and and that tends to uh, tends to stand the test of time pretty well because the fun is is the people you're playing as much as it is the game. The games, in some ways, are a vessel for human interaction, and that's really what I think uh, games need to be. You mentioned your attempt to buy the. Uh uh, uh, former Atari games. What about the uh, when the True Wheels came to the end of their era? Did you uh, try to attempt to get that Atari at all? And were you? It, I was. I was. You know. I was financially screwed up at that point in time, so I couldn't if I wanted to. Um, I basically did some personal guarantees for a great big line of credit with Merrill Lynch. And, boy, did I ever screw my finances up. That's why I'm not living up in Woodside anymore. But, uh, the nice thing about being an entrepreneur is to set up the pieces and do it all again. And that's, that's really the fun part. Yeah? Uh, are there any plans to resurrect older games for PDAs or cell phones? Yes. In fact, we're doing a lot of that ourselves. You'll see some viewing games based on some classics on cell phones, probably uh, this fall. We actually have time for uh, two more questions. And Mr. Bush wants to come up to uh, stay afterwards for signatures and photos. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. How do you feel about the way that Japanese companies have now essentially taken over the whole concept?
toy industry compared to how an American company such as Atari did in the 70s and 80s? Well, I'm, I'm real sad that uh, the dominant player, I mean, it really takes massive screw-ups to abandon the, the dominant play. Uh, you know, and I could, I saw it happening, and uh, I actually predicted, I, I made more money shorting Warner stock during that period than I could have so I was so sorry. Um, I mean, it, it, Somebody needs to actually write a book on all the stupidity that was going on in Atari. It was just incredible. Uh, I would say that the years 1982, 83, uh, there, there had to be, you know, people used to talk about us smoking pot in the planning sessions. I think they had nitrous oxide after that. <laughs> <laughs> Something. See, somebody, they're back here. Are there any other uh, projects that were shelved when the uh, company was sold to Warner or even during uh, Atari's reign that you thought was too exciting? Yeah, Atari Tell. Remember, we had a 22 or 2400 baud modem in the world in which 150 baud was as fast as it was. We actually had plans to do a internet type server based system for gameplay linked uh, clear back in the 70s. And we were well on the way of doing it. In fact, if you look in, Atari has a lot of patents on some early modem technology that was just trashed by Warner. Um, remember, Chuck E. Cheese was started inside Atari. And uh, it was sell it or close it, and I stepped up to buy it. Um, let's see, what other? Uh, there was actually a toy division uh, inside Atari that got closed. Um, there's one other, I can't think what it was. But anyway, yeah, there was a lot of stuff that, that I thought was very, very important. That, uh, oh, uh, special effects generators for, for television. We were planning to do that. There's one other right here. Oh, uh, actually, Steve Buster, Penny, though, was asking if you can ask any compliments or complaints about your successors, particularly Ray Bissard, Jack Trump, and the Canadian Bank, since they have helped out with the Atari. I, I, yeah, I, you know, it's a thing where I, I just, I feel some angst, but you know, it's, people are putting their foot in front of each other, and the fact that they screwed it up, that's probably there. You know, Jack is Jack, and, and <laughs> well, Jack is is a is a is a real character, and uh, and he is uh, he was all, he has always treated me well. Uh, but you know, Jack likes to build things cheap and sell things cheap, and he doesn't like to spend money on the engineering and marketing. It didn't work. <laughs> Thank you very much.